Hello, welcome to this energy talk. Um, and thank you as well for being here. The, the title of this energy talk and uh, my panelists, and I will, I will get them to introduce themselves very, very quickly and get their view on this position. Um, the, the reason why we called it Storage, the Smartphone of Energy, the, the idea behind pulling this talk together actually came from a couple of places. We, uh, well, I read a Navigant report recently which did a survey of utilities in North America and all of the executives within those utilities cited storage as the single biggest disruptive technology to the market. So that's one input. Another input is the, the recent announcements by an echo where they're using a Tesla Powerwall to build a virtual power plant by connecting storage devices which are in the home effectively through the grid, through this VPP. I thought, well, this is interesting. Another thing that, uh, uh, that kind of happened that also caught my attention was, uh, you know, people were looking at some of the price point projections of the power wall, you know, that, that yes, it is somewhat expensive at the moment, but some of the projections and the technology trends and the narratives are going to bring this, um, in my mind, uh, very simplistically, I was going back to plasma TVs, how expensive they were, and you had the plasma versus LCD fight, and then everything became a commodity. Now you can buy a 40-inch TV, in the UK anyway, for 200 quid. I'm not saying it's not a lot of money, but mm -hmm. it's a damn sight cheaper than those things were. So there are all these factors coming in. So we said, well, hang on a minute. Could storage be the smartphone of, uh, phone of energy? Because mm -hmm. the smartphone has enabled comms networks to do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So we say smartphone in the context of not trying to create some strange parallel within the IT comms world, but in the context of what the smartphone did for that world. You know, can it do the, the same here? Um, and then, you know, with the panelists here, we're going to go through some of these narratives. And the other input, just for us to consider, we ran a poll asking that very simple question, is storage the most disruptive technology in the energy sector? And we had, I think, about 71 responses. It's on the app. You guys can carry on voting and change that whole thing. But here's the interesting thing. Yes, 41%. No, 59%. So we'll explore some of that as well. But if I can, otherwise I'm just going to end up monologuing the whole time. <laughs> so Christian, if you can start. Um, if you can tell us, just give us a quick introduction who you are mm -hmm. and uh, give us a, a, a couple of minutes of what you think and then we'll carry on the panel. Yeah, thanks for the, for the introduction. My name is Christian Metzger. I'm with the Energy. Energy is the car world of RWE, so all the renewable business that uh, used to be at Energy, the European utility, is now bundled at, at Energy. So that's for, for the quick introduction. And there I'm responsible for our energy storage related research and development projects. So from B2C to B2B applications up to utility scale, that's basically within uh, my responsibility there. Um, I like the, the analogon of the, of the smartphone because uh, um, it, uh, it underlies the, the, the fact that with energy storage in the B2C sphere, like the, the, the end consumer plays now an important role. Like back in the days, we were just not used to that, that the end consumer comes into the game more than just buying energy from us. But now we have someone in, in the system who, who, who reacts in a way that uh, the, the, in, in the old days we weren't used to. Like in Germany, we have currently something like 45,000 of those B2C um, residential storage units installed, 45,000. And if, you, if you're plain and honest, none of them uh, pay for themselves. So um, it's not a financial sound uh, decision to do that, but people still do that because they just like the idea of being independent. They like the idea of using their own PV generated electricity at home. And uh, um, like we with our old uh, mindset of thinking, yeah, we needs to be rational, needs to be efficient. We don't really understand why people do that. But uh, when, you, when you look at the, at the smartphone allegory, 
people don't buy an iPhone because they think it has a perfect IRR or something. They just like it and they do it. No and one actually uses it as a phone either. Yeah, it's just <laughs> you want to have it and you do it. And also like the German automobile sector, for, for example, just automotive sector, relies on the fact that people just buy cars they like. They don't need them, but they like them. And we, I think we, we will see more and more of that also in the energy uh, sphere because we, the, the, the private customer will gain a more and more important role and uh, do emotional things due to emotional reasons and storage is one of that. Um, it also has like uh, limitations, the image of the smartphone, because what I see in the energy sphere is that we're heavily regulated. Like you, you, do, you don't, don't have to comply to regulations to bring an app to a, to a, to a smartphone. But if you want to do, for example, a primary reserve with a decentral uh, household battery, you have to heavily comply to grid codes, to, to, uh, to, to security standards when it comes to communication. And that makes uh, life really difficult. You know, when you, when you talk about the concept, that's super easy and it works. But when you really want to do it, you will see that it's sometimes uh, kind of difficult due to regulation to actually uh, bring it in. Yeah? And uh, uh, John, can I yeah. ask you to give your view? I mean, it's fascinating. What was it, 45,000? 45,000 systems yeah. right. in Germany. All right, my name is John Hodemakers. I work for Steden, that's a grid operator, as we say, in the Randstad area of the Netherlands. And that's the area where you have the cities of Utrecht, Die Hague, and Rotterdam. So it's it's very dense uh, residential uh, population, but also the big industrial area for the Rotterdam Harbor. So it's very interesting and my job is I'm an innovation manager within the strategy department. That means that I create projects to, to find out how the future will look like and how all kind of new propositions and new technologies will fit into this new energy world. And I, I'm very, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting to hear how many in-home storage systems are already installed in Germany because in the Netherlands we are even just starting to learn what it will be mm. and it's also because uh, we all see the possibilities of storage people see that they can use their own for example solar energy uh, and that gives them a good feeling so they want to use it but on the other hand there is no financial reason to do it tech systems are not, uh, not in the proper way another uh, thing with storage is that uh, you have to pay twice your uh, energy taxes mm because you have to pay energy taxes at the moment you put the energy into the storage system and when you sell it, the buyer has to pay taxes again. So there are a lot of barriers, in fact, that have to be resolved before the, 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 the storage system can be very interesting uh, in the Netherlands. But we're working on it, there's an action plan on it and we're trying to, to give it a boost because personally I see that storage is really one of the possibilities to, to uh, to facilitate the, the future energy system, to facilitate maximum use of sustainable energy for everybody. And that's, uh, I think, one of the most important challenges we have in this energy sector today. Thank you. Tobias? Uh, I'm Tobias Blank. Um, I'm from E.ON, uh, another German utility. Uh, I'm working um, in the solution delivery group, so I'm a um, project engineer for the whole company, um, to, for the internal stakeholders. At the moment I'm working um, mainly for battery system uh, solutions and energy management systems. For the question is storage smartphone of energy. Um, as uh, mentioned before, we have tens of thousands of residential storage solutions in, in Germany, even if they are not, are not economic. Uh, this is, it's, it's really a point, people want them. Um, so in this case, yes, it's a smartphone, um, because it's, um, it's idealistic, you want to have it. It's, uh, and it's almost know, aspirational rather than in rooted in any in rational buy. In, in residential scale, yes. Um, but um, if we go a little bit further to uh, to SME sector, to B two B and industrial mm -hmm. sector, um, the customers want to have profit. It's clear. And um, at the moment, I see we, we can really um, bring systems to the market which are profitable. Clo uh, less than ten years, um, sometimes even five years. Uh, so because there are. Here we have really is a smartphone because the storage system 
can deliver so many applications, not only self-consumption. Uh, it can provide peak shaving, it can uh, be part of a virtual power plant. So we have uh, different revenue streams uh, for a storage system uh, because it can serve different applications. And so the multi-use brings really the smart aspect to the battery, yes. And so if, if I would ask you guys as panelists this poll question, you know, is it the most disruptive technology out there that we're seeing at the moment. Would you be split like the poll is or, or would you by and large agree with it? What would you it's say? It's difficult. I think it would, uh, would yeah, it, it's, it's difficult because it's almost 50-50 yeah, yes. when you look at it. So it, it, it has, and we know uh, that polls have been wrong recently, it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can say that. That's indeed uh, true, yes. Okay. So I think that this storage will bring a change in the system and as you look at it now it will be one of the enablers for the system so I think that's my point of view it's 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 really going to to change the energy system because as you already said it's for the people who are interested in it they can play they can play with it on several markets and that that makes it uh, interesting so I think people will be interested and storage will find its way into the system uh, in some years uh, of course with some regulational changes with some uh, price uh, decrease, I think it's very important. So, so if we if we look at that uh, regulation change yes. question, because the, 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 you know you can put storage behind the meter, or you can have grid scale storage. You know, yes. there's a lot of pilots. I, I know you know how. I mean, this industry loves a pilot, right? Yes. Yeah, you, know, you can go and find pilots everywhere. But there, there, there's some great pilots about grid scale storage, frequency modulation as a use case and so on. But the point I'm trying to get to is, you know, where do you see the most disruptive effect? Because I can't help going back to this analogy of the plasma TV, that if it's aspirational now and these things aren't cheap, when the price point gets driven down, which is the ambition of Tesla with the power wall anyway, it's openly stated, well, you know, what's, what is that going to do when you suddenly start going from 45,000 to 100,000, 200,000? Yeah, I think there was, there was like an interesting study conducted on that. What would happen if uh, all the German PV owners would, uh, all the all the German rooftop owners would invest into PV and would, would invest into uh, um, like a home storage? And they came up with uh, with impressive numbers. You have something like 15,000, 15 million homes which are eligible to PV and, uh, and a home storage when you put like it on every rooftop that, uh, that is suitable. And they came up with uh, with the storage capacity of something like 40 gigawatts and 150 gigawatt hours of storage capacity. That's uh, five or six times the capacity we have now in uh, with, with pumped hydro. So if this really becomes a mass market, then this has a huge uh, huge impact on the on the system design. And I personally agree and uh, believe that it will become a mass market. Up to now, it's still something for, for, for the fans. They do it, although it doesn't pay off with the projected price curves of, uh, of the batteries, with the, with the phase out of the feed-in tariff in Germany uh, and also the rising retail electricity prices. Those systems will become economically feasible in the next two to three days, uh, years. And uh, then people will invest it not only because they like the idea, because they just uh, want to earn, uh, save money with that. And then I would suggest that it will really become a mass uh, uh, phenomenon and really will penetrate the, 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 the energy system. But, but that's really country specific. You know, yeah. in, the, in the Netherlands, we don't see any of those um, uh, residential storage up to now because they have the net metering scheme. So the grid is the uh, is a, is a um, is a huge storage for it's free, so to say. Yes. Uh, in Germany, you have another revenue stream, and there you, there you see a huge demand for for battery system. It's really country specific, and the regulation plays an extremely important role. From my perspective, so basically, because in the Netherlands, Netherlands now you can put your energy into the grid. Mm -hmm and get it back for the same price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why should you buy some, some unit to do mm -hmm. it for you? Yeah. So they can use our grid as long as it's mm -hmm. within reasonable amount of energy mm -hmm. that you put into the grid. So uh, at this moment there is no incentive for customers uh, and to do it. I, Otherwise then like it. Yeah. You want to have it. Uh, I think it's really disruptive because um, we have a lot of uh, parallels with the PV industry, 
Um, at the moment, yes, uh, we see uh, P plus storage is in Germany, for example, is um, economic, but PV without storage is more profitable. But if you wait two years, for example, I think we have to break even. And latest, if the first uh, subsidized PV systems go out of the reg regime, yes. so then uh, we will see so many storage systems in the, uh, in the field that um, so yeah, utilities uh, will, will they have no uh, they have no possibility to to finance their own systems because you have them in the market. It's this uh, it's uh, first with PV the residential and the SME customers started with produce, uh, producing energy. Now they will start with store energy, and uh, you don't need big solutions. And the disruptive uh, thing is, you will bring it to the community, um, and this is a, a very big point. And it's it's happening. It, it doesn't matter if there is a, a law or regulation because the regulation is behind. Yeah. And so what what I'm getting from you, I, I mean regional mm -hmm. things aside, this is happening and when I made this analogy that hey this could be a mass market you weren't sat there going you're bonkers you were mm -hmm. like going, yeah probably mm -hmm. right so so if we can fast forward a little bit let, let's play a little bit of a game here mm -hmm. and uh, I will I'll try and get the audience involved towards the end so uh, you know so those of you watching live here if you have a thought or a question just Keep it in your head. We'll try and grab some of them at the end of uh, the discussion here. Um, when you get to that world and, and you're now, and I'm just playing the scenario, I, I, I can buy this thing, uh, whatever it's called, it's a battery effectively, but I, I don't necessarily have to be connecting it to the grid and so on. Isn't the challenge of the utility to create incentives that these things are connected to the grid so that they can be used a bit like what Eneco have done as a VPP mm -hmm. or what's happened in California where there's a special tariff to incentivize uh, people who have behind the meter batteries to connect it to the grid. Is, isn't that what has to happen for I think it to be useful? Mm -hmm. I think it's important to connect them to the grid and why? Because we already said uh, making it profitable, you have to stack all kind of benefits. You have to stack the benefit of support for the DSO. You have to stack possible benefits for optimizing the portfolio of the BAP, the Balanced Responsible Person Party. Uh, you can do unbalanced uh, mitigation with it. So it's very important for the owner of the system to connect it to the grid. But on the other hand, when they connect it to the grid and they want to, to act on this, this market, as I, I, I say, it's, it's very important that there is a market mechanism to make it work. And that's, uh, that's very important, so everybody has to have access to that market. And that's what we see. I also uh, am uh, connected as stayed in to the USEF Foundation. USEF stands for Universal Smart Energy Framework. And we have developed a framework in which every customer can be connected to the, to the, to the system. They can work in the system by using an aggregator to aggregate in fact all these small amounts of flexibility by all these storage units to one amount of flexibility that can be used in the energy market. So in that way the customer will have an easy access to the, to access to the grid. The aggregator can aggregate in fact all this flexibility and energy to use it on the energy market. And that will be the profit for the user of the storage system to connect it to the grid and not want to be off-grid or that kind of uh, things. And, mm -hmm. and it's very important to make that market work, I think. Yeah, I would always also say that uh, like uh, the users uh, should always be connected physically to the grid because yes. otherwise it's just uh, like in, in northern uh, Germany, northern Europe, it's just uh, impossible to be off-grid with just uh, PV because in the winter time you have like no no no, no yeah, generation. The seasonal, yeah. uh, the seasonal storage. Yeah. This like the, the first part of the question, and the other part is uh, should like the an central aggregator have access on the battery? And I would uh, advocate yes. Um, of course, it would work without, but it would make uh, the situation much more complicated. And we, as an integrated utility, we also have a distribution grid, 
and we and we see that we uh, when when we cleverly use the distrib distributed battery systems, uh, we can solve problems in the distribution grid. We can provide flexibility to the wholesale market. That all makes extremely much sense. Uh, currently, the, it's not a really viable business case, but when you believe that this will become a uh, useful application in the future, you're just, uh, um, you just have to develop those solutions now in order to have them in place in, in the future when you actually can, can monetize them. So um, I think it's, uh, uh, it should be on the agenda of, of every utility to, to try to, uh, to aggregate those decentral assets and make the most out of them in a, in a, in a central system. But it's, but it's tough because uh, like the, the first application you will currently look at is primary reserve. The yes. primary reserve uh, prices are really dropping and uh, to connect uh, decentral battery storage to provide one kilowatt hour or two, kilowatt, uh, two kilowatts of primary reserve that doesn't really pay off because the, like the controlling and the accessing of the of this decentral small asset um, costs you more than you will you'll be able to to generate on the frequency response market. So you have to bring together this this long term vision, which is appealing and I believe in, and the short term reality where where flexibility isn't like monetized enough. Yes. Yeah. And can I bring you in on that because? Mm -hmm. You know, out of everybody in the panel, you were absolutely vocal mm -hmm. when, when you said, yes, it is very disruptive. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things, everything I'm hearing is, is some sort of quite sort of linear thinking about market and reward and things like that. But what, what happens when you get a Tesla ramping up and say, I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got you've got another input where you've got the, 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 the Tesla Model 3 was the most successful car launch in history. So the most successful car launch in history wasn't GM, Ford, Volkswagen, any of those brands, it was Tesla. Um, you've got self-driving technology coming in, right? So these electric vehicles could actually be self-driving batteries as well. You know, let's imagine for a second, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it's going to get a bit weird. Uh, yeah, can you just... Do you see that, uh, 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 Tobias? I mean, are, are you guys looking at that at Eon? For uh, for your EV perspective or um, uh, uh, for a battery perspective into the grid? Just an application of it, you know, the, the, what can it do? Because at the moment, all we've been talking about is very linear things that we can see right now. But, you know, where's the disruption? So this one point is uh, if we have lots of storage into the, into the market. You, uh, you mentioned Tesla, okay. we ha but we have so many uh, suppliers into the, into the market which compete and uh, which can provide um, technology at, uh, at low costs uh, that it will overcome. Uh, and from my perspective, you be with those so many storage uh, in EVs in 10 years um, and uh, in residential and in SME, uh, so we have much we have much more than we need and uh, because a system is, uh, is, is most profitable if you make most use of it because for residential use for example you need 15 to 20 years to use all of the life cycles the system can provide why you why I should use a system just 15 years why I sh uh, it's much more economic if I can bring it to the profit zone after five years because it's, uh, the lifetime is over, I have used it so, as much as possible. So everybody is interested to make most of use of its battery. And um, so the dis so disruption will be, we, uh, the systems come into the market widespread and everybody wants to sell it. And everybody wants to sell the services, want to provide the services. Uh, and because everybody wants to do it, it's going so fast, we want to see new business models. We cannot imagine at the moment. And uh, because it's not possible to have business models today because we don't have the technology. Um, for example, selling uh, power directly to the neighbor and so on, blockchain technology will come over. Commodity is over. So, and batteries are the most uh, interesting te technology for, those, for such things. And on the business models front, I mean, at uh, uh, at Steadin, what, are you are you looking at any of these other business models? Well, at this time, we are as Steadin are just looking at basically looking not just but basically looking at the effect on the grid. So 
So what will be the effect on the grid if all kind of parties will start handling, using, uh, will control in fact the storage units. That's one end and the other end is what can be the benefit of storage units at several points in the grid. So as well at residential uh, level as somewhere in the medium voltage grid for example. So that's what we, what's basically our point of interest at this moment. Uh, Hi, uh, Christian, can I, can I bring you in? Do you have anything to add on the business model side? Or what I'm really trying to get to is maybe, okay, the now ones, but mm -hmm. if you let your mind free, are, are there mm -hmm. any others that you can see that, well, this could potentially happen? It's, it's not that insane that this may happen if a few other things come into play. But I think what would really change the, the landscape would be if, uh, if people uh, also in a developed country would decide to go completely off grid. Currently, that's really that's a far that's far away because uh, it would be extremely expensive to do so. If other technologies come in um, or batteries uh, get ridiculously uh, cheap, PowerGX technology can be used uh, in a decentral way. Then we could find ourselves in a situation where where, where we don't even need. Uh, grids and, and a network anymore. I don't really see that to, to happen uh, um, and I don't really think it would be a wise thing to do so, but if the technology develops in that way, it could be a viable option that uh, people just decide, no, well, I just go off grid, uh, um, it's cheaper for me and I, I don't really want to care about this whole hassle with, uh, with the regulation and, uh, uh, and the grid connected. That could be like really something extremely disruptive, but I don't really see it happen currently. But you think it, it's not Impossible. It's that, not impossible. That yeah. Horizon. It will. I think you have to decide between like developed countries where you have a good infrastructure and uh, battery comes in as a new component, um, and you have to look into emerging countries, India, Africa, where you don't have a grid in place, and when you now have like a, a super cheap PV and you have extremely cheap batteries, then completely new systems will develop there. I don't really think that they will decide to build up this uh, this this meshed energy system also in rural parts of India and Africa because you just don't need it anymore. You make a microgrids hybrid system with a battery, PV, and maybe a di maybe a diesel. That's cheaper to de deploy, easier to to deploy. Um, so we probably see see there completely uh, different system designs because they start with a different uh, with a different starting base. Huh? Yes. Yeah. It's basically a greenfield situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's different from our situation where we have a very dense, very good grid in fact uh, mm -hmm. to to uh, to support customers so that's a that's a different situation yes mm -hmm. and uh, so we've got five minutes left to run i'm mm -hmm. just going to ask the audience watching here do you guys have any questions if not i got plenty more yes mm -hmm. if you shout it out we'll so, i'll replay yeah. <laughs> so i think the analogy is better uh, as a dsl mode because i think the challenge is the energy network just what the early DSL operators had 10 or 15 years ago. You have people uh, streaming content, uh, creating a lot of demand on the network. You have peer-to-peer -peer creating a lot of generation into the network. And modems became control endpoints on the network, so you can shape the traffic. And I think batteries perform a similar vital function mm -hmm. for energy. And I think once we get beyond the early adopter stage in the utilities and, and, and the network, what do you guys think about that? Mm, yeah, I think what, what, you're, uh, what you're referring to is uh, that, that the DSO has to have means to, to manage the energy flows because uh, when, you, when you think about time of use tariffs, it could result in a situation that many people like take electricity at the same time, store it somewhere, that would really make the situation worse for the, for the DSO. Um, there are currently the, uh, like discussions going on how, how this could be solved. And uh, one model that is currently discussed in Germany is the so-called um, traffic line model that you have like several, several phases. Like in the green phase, everybody can do what he wants. The market can react uh, as ever, um, however he wants. Then there's the, the red phase, obviously, where the DSO takes over control. He can just uh, say, no, no trading anymore. You don't do that. Uh, I have a priority. And the interesting part is the, the yellow phase, where basically uh, also the DSO um, goes into a market and contracts flexibility and pays uh, the owner of a, uh, of a decentralized battery storage a certain amount of money to use it in the DSO-friendly way. Mm -hmm. And this is currently uh, designed how this should look like. There are several demonstration projects on the way to, to, to showcase that in the next years. And this will be like a huge challenge to bring the DSO perspective together with the individuals who do whatever they want and they don't really care on the system effects. Huh? Yeah.
Yeah. Can I bring the two of you in as we? Yes, that's basically the same as we uh, we look at it at Staden, because we, of course we think the market is the first party in the system to act, and uh, that's why at Staden we also adopted the Yusef model that also has mm -hmm. a traffic light system. Mm -hmm. It's very important that the market can have full operation in the grid, can, can have every uh, contract and exchange of energy until the moment that there will be a conflict to the grid situation and that's what's called in the user phase that there will be a validation by the grid operator to make sure that the, the, the transactions on the grid will not lead to any problems. So it's basically the same, but market is in lead we think, uh, because the market has to work as, as, as open as possible. Do you have a view? Uh, yeah, here we, are, we also have the, yeah, the gap between regulation and the market. And uh, one hand side uh, says um, the DSO has to provide the grid that everything will work uh, with, this, with the storage system and the prosumers. Um, from my perspective, it makes sense to, to go as fast as possible to uh, time of use tariffs for grid use. Uh, because then uh, the market will do as it uh, has to work uh, because if it's too expensive to deliver my uh, energy from the north of, uh, of Europe to the south I, I, will do it, uh, I won't do it and um, if it's much cheaper to buy my energy from my neighbor this, uh, this is the right way and so regulatory framework makes it much more complex than we want to have it so we have come to the end of our time. We're going to have to wrap it there. I think we achieved our objective to just highlight what's coming. And it's very interesting that none of us argued that it was going to be a mass market. It's not when, but it's not if, but when. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you as well for watching. Many more uh, energy talks on our YouTube channel. Sorry for the feedback there. I got to talk a bit quieter. But thanks again for joining us. Very nice. Thank you.